Hi there, I'm Claire McDonald Liu and this is the Family Health Lab. In today's conversation, I'm talking about the importance of meat for family health with Dr. Anthony Chafee. Dr. Chafee is an American medical doctor and neurosurgical registrar, now based and practicing in Australia. His nutrition science research has led him to become a leading advocate for the carnivore lifestyle as an option for treating and preventing chronic diseases. Find out what Anthony believes families should be eating and whether kids should go carnivore. You're listening to the Family Health Lab. Healthy parents, healthy kids. Hi Anthony, thank you so much for jumping on to talk about protein and meat and family foods with me and for me to learn a bit about carnivore diet. Oh, you're very, very welcome. Thank you for having me on. It's good to see you again. Yeah, lovely. We just met a few weeks ago uh, again at the Low Carb Roadshow, which was which was quite, it was good fun. It was well attended. It was, yeah, it was very good. How interested such a, a different demographic work. We had a lot of older people um and they were really really curious about carnivore mm. and really happy to embrace it after after your talk yeah it was really nice and it was it was very positive to see the reception and a lot of people that would come up afterwards and asking these questions which are very very fair questions you know well but what about fiber and don't you need nutrients and isn't isn't you know cholesterol bad for you and all these sorts of things and uh and then just a lot of people just saying okay how, how do i get started how do i do this you know and and other people that had been Start, had already started a carnivore diet and had had significant improvements just coming up to say you know their their appreciation and that that uh, they were happy that this information was getting more and more available to, to people to help themselves what does a typical day look like for you typical day in the office uh, it's, it's very busy um, even you know, I could argue that it's more busy because we do a lot of a lot of on calls and and dealing with a lot of the on the ground sort of works that um, uh, just busy. Yeah, there's a lot of patients, a lot of phone calls, a lot of uh, interactions with other teams, and uh, a lot of sick people. So in Western Australia, the uh, there's only one neurosurgical department for the pub, whole public system in all of WA, and so that's us. And so all the calls, all the issues, all the turmoil. Uh, comes to us and so it can be quite busy so normally my day-to-day -day, I'm taking a, a bit of time off now because I have so many conferences and other projects and, and research and things like that that I'm working on at the moment that uh, I just needed to take a bit of time off um, and even then I'm still uh, fully busy but normally when I when I am at the hospital that's usually about six days a week six to seven days a week and uh, if I'm lucky five and a half days a week and then so on those days that I have maybe a weekend free or a day of the weekend free, I also work in a functional medicine clinic or, or maybe call it preventative health clinic. And uh, we also do bariatric medicine. So trying to help people lose weight and get, get healthy and come off medications and things like that. And so I always work seven days a week because of that and then i started you know my podcast the plant free md and my youtube channel and that has sort of taken a life of its own and so i'm so the in the afternoons and evenings that i don't have uh you required of me to work or be on call or be at the hospital i um i'm uh you know working working on that so it's uh it's quite busy but uh, i really enjoy it because i'm i'm very passionate about each and every one of these uh, aspects of, of medicine and healthcare, and it's it's something that even even in, though neurosurgery is a very very specific field, diet and nutrition still plays a very integral role in neurosurgery and people dealing with neurosurgical afflictions. And it can and it can help anyone in any situation uh, just optimize their health. Even if you're if you're saying, well, you have this surgery, you had this accident, there's nothing that could really, you know, nutrition is not helping you not fall off a ladder, but it can help you recover. From surgery, and you know, we do know that even just ketogenic diets are, are a significant benefit of people recovering from traumatic brain injuries or strokes. And so, you know, even just right there, you say, "Hey, you've had this major brain injury. Your brain needs to heal. It needs ketones to do that." And so, you should you should maybe think about about uh, these sort of dietary interventions. And so, it can it can be useful in every aspect of medicine i believe and so i just i've i've just been very excited about that and uh, and happy that i can bring this to to my patients um i can see that see that motivation and the um podcast that you mentioned and talks that you're giving they are wildly popular 
um, uh, which excites me because it means that I, I believe it means that m many more people are getting interested themselves. It may not necessarily be coming um, through their, their doctor yet or their medical practice, but um, they have access to information and the fact that they're tuning in and informing themselves is, is, is wonderful, I think. I'm curious why food um, forms such an important part of your life. The, uh, your uh, upbringing, were your parents very interested in uh, in nutrition or or was it, I know, I know you've mentioned on, in other talks and podcasts, you, you mentioned a particular, um, course that you did and a particular class that you took, but were the roots within your family as well? Yes, definitely. It was, it's, you know, I was a kid. It was always impressed upon us to, you know, to eat properly and to eat a certain way. And, and you know, back then it was a low fat whole food diet because the thought was back in the eighties and nineties and even today that, eating anything with fat is going to clog your arteries, it's going to cause heart disease, it's going to give a heart attack, you know, later on in life, uh, which is not the case. That is absolutely false. Um, but that was, that was the thought. And so my father was very concerned about that because his father died of a heart attack when he was in his fifties. And, uh, that was very devastating to the family. And, um, and so he was quite worried about that. And he was very determined to not, you know, leave his family in in his fifties and have us not have anyone to to care for us and raise us and and uh, and be there for us, for us. And so he was determined to not let that happen to him. And so he looked at uh, what was called the Pritikin diet, which was a very popular heart health diet back then. And it had a number of different staples, which was um, you know whole food, eating whole foods, also eating meat, but but removing the fat from the meat, but also removing sugar and processed foods and all, and just getting away from that. So it actually, I think, probably did help people, but not because it got rid of fat. And that's what the thing that people most focus on is that Pritikins, there's no fat, no fat, no fat. Well, that's not all of it. There were more to, there was more to it than that. And one of the main things was it got rid of processed food and sugars and things like that. And so I think it probably did help for those reasons, but probably didn't help because of getting rid of the fat. I think fat is an essential nutrient. So that was always impressed upon us. That was always in my head as, as uh, you, you should eat properly, you should always eat properly, you should always be careful about what you put in your mouth, you shouldn't eat junk food, things like that. And um, and so being always interested in medicine and, be, and wanting to become a doctor since I, I can remember, I was always interested in biology and the human body and how, how we worked just physio physiologically. And so when I was in college and university, I was studying biology and I was studying botany and I was studying nutrition because that was just interesting to me because I wanted to know how the body worked. I wanted to know, uh, you know, what we could do to, to make our, our lives better. And uh, me as an athlete, I was very interested in that as well because I wanted to, to put in, you know, good things so that, that I could I could uh, work properly so that I could perform better on the field. And, uh, and as you say, I, had, I took a class in cancer biology at the University of Washington in Seattle, uh, which was you know, one of the top medical schools in the world, actually. They, they're usually ranked number one in the US every year. Them and Johns Hopkins go back and forth between number one and number two. And, um, and you know, my genetic professors were head of the Human Genome Project. The University of Washington ran the Human Genome Project. And so it's, you know, it's a very, very, very strong uh, school for, in general, I think it's the number 14 school in the world. Uh, I checked the other other day. And it uh, is very strong in medical sciences and biological sciences. And so I was taking cancer biology from one of the top cancer biologists, you know, in the country. And we just went through how plants actually ha use defense chemicals to stop animals and insects from eating them. And some of these defense chemicals can actually be carcinogenic. You know, we know this intuitively, you get lost out in the woods, you can't just eat any random plant because most of them will make you very sick or even kill you. And so out of the 340,000 plants in the world, most of those are inedible. Most of those will cause serious harm or even kill you. And we eat a, a scant few of those plants. And, and yet we think that somehow these are not only safe, but, but beneficial to us. And it's like, well, that's a theory, but you know you need to be careful about that because the nature of plants is is to be poisonous. And so we were looking at this from a cancer perspective, and we were looking at at the everyday produce items that we would eat, and in America and around the world, and uh, and looking at the number of carcinogens in them. 
And they they knew even then, 20 some years ago, that there were 136 known human carcinogens just in Brussels sprouts and over 100 just in mushrooms and over 60 or 80 in spinach, kale, mushroom, celery, cabbage, cucumbers, broccoli, and you name it. And they were quite abundant. We know from the work of Professor Bruce Ames in the 1980s at UC Berkeley that the naturally occurring toxins that he found at the time, they actually found a lot more after that, but the ones that he he knew about outweighed the pesticides we were spraying on them by a factor of 10,000. And that the naturally occurring toxins were far more likely to cause cancer than the pesticides we were spraying on them. Specifically, mushrooms were 500 times more likely to cause cancer than ALAR, which was the pesticide they were they were comparing these against in that study. So we were quite, quite blown away by this. And, uh, and I was just thinking, this must be a joke. Someone's must be in on this. Just looking around wildly like, okay, who, who's laughing? And, and they must be, this, just, some, this has to be a joke. And... It dawned on me eventually and all of us that, that he wasn't joking and he was very serious about this. And I remember just thinking in my head, and I was like, but, but vegetables are still good for you though, right? And he just must have read our minds because he looked at us and he just said, I don't eat salad. I don't eat vegetables. I don't let my kids eat vegetables. Plants are trying to kill you. I was like, right, okay. Uh, that's that that hammers at home. That makes it pr pretty clear. And of course, that that is the case. You know, plants are not your friends. They are not trying to feed you and, and nourish you. They're not, you know, Gaia, Mother Earth, and the Garden of Eden. That is just trying. They, they are there for themselves. They are there to survive. And that's the 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 underlying theme of life is to survive. And if you're eating them and you're killing them and eating of their body, like they're not going to survive. Same with animals. And that's why animals have defenses as well. They can run away. They can fight back. They have horns. They have claws. They have teeth. They have hooves. And they can hide. Plants can't do that. They're stationary. So they need other means of defense. And so that that is one of their main main defenses. And this is something, um, you know, when I talk to doctors about this and they're like, but why, why isn't this more well known? Why don't more people know this? And I, and I uh, remind them that every single botanist on earth knows this. It's just that no one studies botany because it's boring, you know? So, <laughs> well, oh, no. well, but you know, well, it's, 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 most people think of it as boring, but I actually, I actually, I remember going through liking biology and be like looking at a class on botany. I'm like, ugh, do I really want to just, you know, go through a taxonomy, a whole bunch of different classifications of leaves. I'm like, that sounds awful, you know? But, you know, I did take uh, other, other botany classes. They're actually very interesting. And now I study, you know, studying more botany just because I've been interested in, uh, you know, from this standpoint, it's actually super interesting. Plants are fascinating. It's a, it, your take on this uh, and you bringing this to the the mainstream as you are doing. Um, I, I mean, it's fascinating, as you say, um, other people are just not talking about, about this. I mean, really, um, plants have an inbuilt um, protection, self-defense mechanism to stop them being absorbed. And although we're not talking about plants trying to kill us, um, although from your low carb down under talk that that's, that's been viewed and people are switching onto this topic out of interest. I think in terms of nutrition, as, as uh, we're going through our courses and we're learning about the enzymes and how, how we, we, we wouldn't talk about it as plants trying to kill you. We'd talk about it as, um, the, the nutrients that are there. The phytonutrients, the minerals, the, the, the goodness within these plants. Um, they're, they're hard to absorb. They're not as bioavailable. And I think that's, they're the kind of terms people would probably be more familiar with. And, and then, you know, there are ways of then, um, making those nutrients more bioavailable. So from fermentation and light cooking and, um, preserving and things we have been doing for generations and um, to to be able to, to absorb those but it is interesting because you changed your philosophy on the way you ate um, completely over 20 years ago and you you know you, you I think you described kind of um, a, a little bit of an on-off relationship at times with with a carnivore approach but but now you're fully uh, carnival. So, what is that? What does what does that mean in practice? What's that look like? Yeah, so it, it means just eating meat and only drinking water. I think it's as important what not to eat as what to eat. So, you eat meat, you eat fatty meat because fat is not just a calorie source; it's a nutrient. It's an essential nutrient that we have to have for our, our the the proper workings of our brain and body, and especially the the development and maintenance of our brain and body. And so, I I eat fatty meat, and uh, and that's it. And um, 
so yeah and um you know because i think as i said i think it's as important what not to eat as what to eat so my hard rule for myself is no plants no sugar or sweeteners nothing artificial and that goes for sauces seasonings and drinks as well and so that just means just meat and water whole meats i cook steak and i eat steak and i know i'm not and it actually saves a lot of time because i'm not spending hours with a bunch of ingredients and mixing things and measuring things and doing this and doing that and have it come out good or bad you know, I just, I just, I, I meal prep by aging steaks and I take a big steak out every day and I just, you know, throw it on the grill or throw it on the pan, uh, throw it in the air fryer and it's, and it's done in 10 to 15 minutes. I let it rest for, you know, 10 minutes or so. And then that's it. And it's just, I've got a Michelin star quality steak every single day. It's absolutely amazing. and I love it. And so, you know, this is the only thing I've wanted to eat anyway. And now I get to eat that every single day, guilt, uh, guilt free. I, I, I've, you know, often commented, uh, you know, that every day feels like my birthday because, you know, on your birthday, you get the meal that you're supposed to, this is your birthday meal. You know, there's no guilt. I can have all the cake and the pie and the this. And it's my birthday. It's one day a year I get to indulge. Well, for me, every, every birthday, I wanted a big fat steak. You know, with like a butter sauce, like a Bernays sauce or something like that, and or or just the, the big steak on its own, and uh, and that's what I wanted. That's always what I wanted. And so my mom would just make me this massive, massive thing when I was a teenager, and and that's what I wanted. That's what I always loved. And now every single day I get that big, amazing steak, and I just I fill myself up on this delicious steak. So every day feels like my birthday. Um, mm. yeah, so, how, how awesome! Yeah, and and take, so take, so so take it and. Um, I just, you know, I was making dinner last night and I was thinking because we were, I knew we were having this chat today and I was always getting out but the this and the that and making the sauce. I was thinking all of this time and really the centerpiece is the, the meat. Um, all of the other stuff just takes a lot of, a lot more time. Um, so a couple of questions around that I'm curious about because, so I'm curious about meat in general. Um, we are in a, polarized situation really in terms of what people should be eating people are very very confused and i i think there's a lot of messaging coming out that we have problems with meat we shouldn't be eating as much of it uh, so i'm really curious on on your take on that um should people be concerned about you how much meat you're eating for example well i mean they, they may be concerned but they, they certainly don't need to be um, I'm extraordinarily healthy and my blood results all show uh, the same. So, you know, objectively, my objective health markers and biological and biochemical markers are all in peak physical health. And um, and so, no, people shouldn't shouldn't be worried about me. Um, when you when you're looking at meat, you think about it this way. Meat is perfectly bioavailable. We get everything that we need in the proportion that we need it from meat. And it's all bioavailable. We have perfect mechanics, biomechanics to extract maximal amount of nutrients from this this stuff that we eat what does that mean that means that we're designed to eat it you don't get that same uh that that same response from plants we're talking about bioavailability uh, and that's because these different nutrients that are bound up in plants sometimes you cannot access them at all at all or maybe only a small degree and that's because we are not designed to eat them and that that's really what this comes down to what are we designed to eat as animals what have we been eating throughout the entire history of humanity and that that is that is meat like all the best evidence shows that that is meat that is what we are biologically designed to eat and we are not biologically designed to eat plants and they sequester those nutrients away i mean even just cellulose fiber we cannot break that down we can't get nutrients from that that's strings of glucose just like glycogen just like blood sugar but it's bound up in such a way that we cannot access it right and that's because the plant does not want us to access it it's trying to defend itself through poisonous means but also by not allowing its nutrients its body to be nutritious to something else. And, and you know, and so uh, you see various examples of that and having to process things, having to put corn through niche tomalization to make the niacin available, which normally it's not. It's corn has a ton of niacin, and yet millions of people around the world died of niacin uh, deficiency called pellagra because they were eating a whole bunch of corn because it was cheap and it was available, and they were dying from this. And the irony was, was that corn has a ton of niacin in it. It's just not bioavailable and so they have to put it through this big chemical industrial process, which people in Mesoamerica used to do. It's called niche tamalization. That's where the word tamale comes from. And and that allowed the, the, the niacin and other things to be more bioavailable, detoxified things to a certain extent. And uh, But 
the simple fact that you have to do that means that you are not designed to do that. If you're designed to do that, your body would do it automatically. But it doesn't. It can't. And you can eat raw meat and you can get everything you, you need from meat. And a lot of people do. Uh, you know, the Inuits just eat a whole bunch of raw seal and blubber and things like that. You know, same with the, the Maasai. So, uh, and they'll cook meat as well. But they'll also eat raw dairy, raw blood, things like that. So you don't have to put it through a chemical process to be able to extract it. So um, if we are biologically designed to eat something, where in the world have you ever seen an animal that's biologically designed to eat something and, and they get sick from that? And that's actually suboptimal for them. That actually harms them. I guess the closest example maybe would be like a koala. You know, uh, that eucalyptus is just completely toxic and, and they seem to get some sort of narcotic effect from that. Maybe they like that. Um, but uh, it does seem to build up some of these toxins in their bone marrow and things like that um, because they're not perfectly adept at, at eliminating this sort of stuff. But, um, you know, what else are they going to eat? Is there something else that's going to be better for them? You know, the likelihood is, is that they're not going to be able to eat other things either, you know, because they don't have the defenses to those other things. So, you know, meat doesn't have anything that we don't need. People talk about fat, fat being bad for you. Well, it's not, you know, the, the Journal of the American College of Cardiology published in 2020, a large literature review looking at all the best uh, uh, randomized controlled trials and, and uh, the best uh, meta-analyses on the issue. And they found that there was not even a correlation between higher saturated fat intake and cardiovascular disease, right? So all of the, there, there's no high level evidence to show that cholesterol causes heart disease, none. The best that they ever had were weak correlations and correlate or even stronger correlations, but the ones that had stronger correlations uh, were found to be fraudulent. They doctored the data. And so that was, they actually, if you actually look at the data, they actually had no correlation. There was no correlation or even an inverse correlation uh, between cholesterol levels and heart disease, which is what we actually found in the Framingham study, which was misrepresented by the AHA, the American Heart Association, as saying that the more cholesterol you had, the higher your heart disease rates were. In fact, they found the opposite. People that had lower rates of uh, lower levels of car uh, cholesterol had higher uh, rates of cardiovascular disease, but we are taught the opposite in medical school. That's what I was taught in medical school. Uh, but if you look it up, the, the the actual study shows differently. And so, the the uh, Journal of the American College of Cardiology found again there was no correlation. You can't prove causation from correlation, but if you show that there's no correlation, that proves there is no causation. You have to have correlation if there's causation. And so if there's no correlation, there is absolutely no causation. So they found no correlation between higher levels of saturated fat and heart disease. And in fact, they found an inverse correlation between higher levels of saturated fat and, uh, and stroke rate. So the more saturated fat people were eating, the lower their stroke rate. The less saturated fat they're eating, the higher their risk of stroke. And so this goes completely counter to the idea that fat is bad for us. And in fact, there's a number of, of studies looking at LDL cholesterol finding the exact same thing. They found an inverse correlation. The, the Framingham study found an inverse correlation. That's one of the seminal pieces in cardiology uh, in, in the cholesterol theory of, cancer, of heart disease. Um, and in fact, it, it found the exact opposite of what it was reported to have found. And there are a number of other studies that, that support that as well. But if you just think down to, to get down to brass tacks and first principles, what are we designed to eat? We're designed to eat meat. We're designed to eat fat. The animal kingdom runs on fat. You know, why would we be the only animal on earth that it just gets heart disease and, and, and decay from eating fat? All animals on earth eat fat. You know, maybe some insects are eating some, some uh, you know, uh, nectar or honey and things like that. All the rest of them run on protein and fat. Even herbivores that just eat eat. Uh, plants and fiber, they actually break down that fiber, the gut bacteria break down the fiber into short chain fatty acids and protein. So they eat grass, but what they're absorbing is fat and protein. And then carnivores, 66% of all animals are carnivores, and they are going out because they can't turn plants into fat and protein. So they have to eat animals that have the fat and protein already. They have to eat animal tissue to build and maintain their own animal tissue. And there are some animals that are able to turn plant tissue into animal tissue. That's very difficult. That's that's a magic trick. And they're able to do that, but we're not. And most animals are not. And so, you know, they have to get that fat and protein from something else. Why would we be the only animals for which fat and protein was toxic? So, so it, for you, it boils down to what we're designed to eat. 
um, probably biologically, all, all of that. So for 1.8 million years, we've been eating meat. And now in the last 50 or, or more decades, chronic disease is at a massive increase. And we're, we've been switched off eating cholesterol and saturated fats. Meat has been demonized. Traditional um, foods that our grandparents and their parents and their parents would have eaten where we didn't have these rates of chronic disease um, we, we've now been swayed away from them completely. And what I see in my practice as a nutritionist and when I'm going into schools, I don't see children eating a lot of meat. For, for me, um, you know, the statistics are showing that we've, we have declined on eat, uh, eating these fats and eating, eating meat and particularly red meat. And when we, we, we're still eating lean meat, um, I love that you're emphasizing fats. Um, and I, in the carnival community, I sometimes see people just eating meat and, and red meat and, um, and steaks, but they seem quite lean. I, I love that you emphasize fats. I mean, our brain needs fats. Children's brains needs fats. We, we had a re- brief conversation before we, um, got on here about, uh, my, what I gave my son for breakfast. I gave him homemade burgers. Um, and I was just like, chomp, when he, when he's chomping down on those and, and, uh, you know, I'll offer him a steak regularly if that's what he just wants for dinner, because that's absolutely fine by me. I really do emphasize the, that children and a, a particularly vulnerable group that, that can't be kind of swayed off what they need. Um, and from, from meat, they're getting things that they couldn't get, um, from, from plants alone unless they had supplementation. So we, we're talking building blocks to muscles. We're talking about their brain development. Um, and at, at the young age, I mean, like my children are older now, but, you know, the development of, um, you know, young, young children, that's uh, crucial for their cognition and motor skills, their language skills. You know, the brain is, is growing at a phenomenal rate. And that, that's when they need these things the most. So it's really important, I think, that, that we're championing and we're, we're getting, I think, getting back to traditional foods. I, um, I am interested in nose to tail and I'm interested in your, I think you term it gold, bronze, silver type, types of eating. So could you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah. Oh, I know. I was just going to say too, I mean, to your point about, about eating fat and how important it is. Um, you know, again, going to our physiology, we have four organs that working in concert to specifically absorb fat, right? Our liver makes bile, gallbladder stores it. Our liver or our pancreas uh, secretes lipase, which breaks it down. The bile then abs- uh, emulsifies that and your small intestine absorbs it. So you have four organs all that have a specific role just to absorb fat. Any one of those things goes off, you don't absorb fat at all. So if that were bad for us, why would our body be working so hard just to absorb it? That doesn't make any any kind of sense and no one has ever been able to, to explain that one to me uh, who argues that we shouldn't eat fat. Um, so to your point, fat's very important. And again, you have a you have a, a specific capacity to absorb fat. You can't absorb fat much without uh, bile. And so when you run out of bile, you you generally excrete most of the fat. You can absorb a little bit. Most of it goes out. And so I think that that's how much your body wants. I don't think your body makes does anything by accident and just makes a random amount of bile because it wants a random amount of fat. This is an important nutrient and it's a specific nutrient. And so it wants this amount and so it makes that amount of bile because it wants that amount of fat in return and so i think that's what we should give it to uh give to us uh, our bodies um as far as um you know what what we're mentioning there with um uh gold and silver and everything like that sometimes i talk about like the different kinds of meats that people eat and um and like you know should they eat just grass fed grass finished like the perfect highest nutrition uh and and there is a difference you know we can look at this we can look at this uh by number of nutrients and by uh, and the density of the nutrients yes grass fed and finished especially on regenerative farms uh do have more nutrients and there was a there was one gentleman who has a sort of a regenerative farm uh model he was giving a, a talk at at a university in America and he was talking about eggs in America, the average, the national average is like 41 milligrams of folate in an egg, but his were over a thousand milligrams of folate, right? So it was a massive, massive increase in, in the density of nutrients. So there are definitely better, more nut- nutrients in these things. There's a better nutrient profile. There's a better fat profile, less linoleic acid in grass fed and finished, or just whatever the animals meant to eat, you know, they, they have a better complement of nutrients. Um, there aren't too many studies 
showing a difference in outcome. So people that are eating grass-fed and finished meat versus grain-finished meat, they still do extremely well. And so I think in the, in the for optimal, 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 best health you could ever have, yeah, sure, you know, go for that if you can, if you can afford it. But if you can't afford it, you don't have access to it. Don't feel bad getting the grain-finished beef because, you know, I think of it like, you know, as you said, with the gold and silver medals at the Olympics. So, you know, gold medal, you know, person who won the gold, obviously they did the best. Person who got silver lost to gold, but they also beat everyone else on earth. And so, you know, getting silver medal at the Olympics is actually pretty damn good. And it's, uh, and if you can't get gold, I would easily settle for silver. And so uh, the majority of what I eat is, is grain finished beef uh, from Costco because I can buy it in bulk. It's good quality. It's cheap. And, um, and that's what I have access to when I can get, if I can get a regenerative farm to, you know, get me a cow that's, you know, four times the nutrients, I, I would do that. In America, it's, it's, it's easier to do that. And I was able to do that. I was able to get an older cow. It was like 10 years old, grass fed its whole life. And it was amazing. It tasted absolutely fantastic. And I found I ate less. I found I ate a lot less and I felt better and more charged. And I think that's probably part of it. Your, your body is chasing nutrients more than it chases calories per se. And so, you know, when I, you know, ate, you know, a steak and they're mostly lean because they don't really have marbling, but they have exterior fat. So the fat's still there. Uh, you just have to tell the butcher, don't cut it off. You know, it's just, just keep all of it. If you're buying a cow yourself, just say, don't cut the fat off. I want all the fat. Um, and so the fat's still there, but it's, um, it's much more nutrient dense. And so I found that I just ate far less and I was far more satiated. And so, you know, I think that's that's probably an advantage. So it could just be that you're not getting quite as much nutrients, so you have to eat more meat and to get those nutrients. And um, and so, but you can you can get the same nutrients. But for, you know, until we don't really have any studies showing better or worse endpoints from eating, you know, grass-fed uh, and grain-finished. But at the same time, we, we don't necessarily have studies that are designed to look at all those endpoints. You know, we're just looking at major diseases and illnesses, you know? Uh, yeah, and they are, it, it's hard to, um, to to put on nutritional um, trials of, of the size for, and, and I, I don't see them being done. But we do know, as you've already said, that the nutritional profile of um, different quality of, of meats, uh, omega-3 fatty acid um, uh, to six is, is a significant one. Um, and we need we need that um, for anti-inflammation, et cetera, et cetera. It's really quite an important one. But um, and I, I I agree. I think uh, working in school nutrition programs, I work to get um, pupils to the government nutrition standards, um, which wasn't you know ideal. It's not exactly how I would like families to to be eating, but it was it was a step up. It, so you, it depends where you are with your food and your shopping and your health. Um, and taking every step you can. I do sometimes get a little concerned when um, I, I meet somebody, say I, I met somebody, um, an athlete who was carnivore, and he, he was saying, well, I'm carnivore, so it's all good. I'm, I'm trying to tackle my autoimmune hmm. um, disease, but I, I tend to eat, buy everything from the garage because it's it's meat, Ew. so I'm, I'm buying those uh, bars, what are they called? Those like meat stick bars, mm -hmm. and I'm snacking on those, and I'm having chorizo for my lunch, and yeah. all, all yeah. from really. So I do think I do think then you know pro whole meat the processed yeah. yeah whole meat is is a good point, and I think then it's the nitrates, the hormones, the chemicals, the sugars, the colorings, the additives. So I do think that's kind of probably on the on that end of the spectrum, the in terms of pushing up to to a whole meat is, is worth kind of just noting. Um, yeah, and those to tail, um, you, years ago when we were in England, we could get, and it depends where you live as well. We lived in the countryside. We were surrounded by organic farmers, bio, um, what we were by deer farm as well. And the deer farm would give us, um, it wasn't a farm actually, it was a national park. Um, and they would give us, oh, a pair clips falling out. They, they would give us um, the um, fats from the internal organs and we would make our own tallow. Uh, and uh, so we were kind of cooking in it and eating it and making peppy cans out of it. So um, very, very interested in the fats and the good quality fats, but also at the organ meat, I was getting kidney and um, liver and I was grinding it up and putting it in homemade sausages to kind of get the kids to eat a little bit of organ meat. And you did mention this in your recent talk, uh, eating 
um, organ meat as part of of, uh, of the carnivore diet. And so, how how does that fit in for you? Um, yeah, I think I think especially when someone's coming to a carnivore diet early on, they're they're going to be coming from a, a nutritionally deprived diet. Like just a standard Western diet is pretty poor in nutritional content. Most people are nutritionally de deficient in vitamins and minerals. And, and this is reflected in in the uh, in just the lab tests because the lab tests show an average for the community. It's not like the the range of good health. Oh, you want to be in this range because that's good health. No, this is the average range. And so the first two thousand people that come into a lab that year, they get the blood test done. That's the that's the reference range. And so those reference ranges are coming down and down and down and down and down and down and down. So that's just showing the average person is just getting more and more deficient. And when you actually look at ranges for optimal health, it's very different. So normally like with B12, you know, in Australia, um, the normal range is around 160 to two or to, to 620, but below 400, you can actually get neurological damage and demyelination of your, of your axons and your nerves. So, you know, so there's a huge range there of hundreds of points that, that are called normal because they're, they're in the reference range that are in, a, in an actual deficient state that is going to cause brain damage, right? And so that's not good. So a better range for health than B12 is 800 to 1200, right? So even, even what's considered high for the reference ranges now is actually too low still for optimal health. So People are generally nutritionally deprived, and we're just calling this normal now. And people are getting sort of worse and worse. So, I think if you're coming from that state or you know a plant-based state, these plants don't have bioavailable nutrients, and sometimes they don't even have the requisite. They actually don't have all the requisite nutrients that we need for just normal sustaining of life, uh, which obviously lets you know that this is not what we're biologically designed to eat because we can't even get basic nutrition from it. And you can't get basic nutrition. It's obviously a deficient diet. That's a definition. And so if you're coming from that state, then things like, like liver and organ, other organs, they're very, very dense, uh, nutritionally dense, and they can catch you up. And I think it's important to catch up, or even with supplements, getting a B12 shot if you're below 400, I think is important. And uh, you, need to get, you need to get above that deficiency level because you are causing harm. And, uh, and so, you know, liver... Uh, can be very, very important, and certainly having some some liver every now and then can be quite beneficial. I do find that for myself, my levels are excellent in that, you know, you know, and above the normal reference ranges. They're in that optimal range for actual good health. Just just eating skeletal meat and uh, and fat, and I think that. You can you can get there eventually, but not everyone starts there. And so I think that organs, especially early on, can be your best friend. And um, but you know, just like the Inuit don't eat organs because, especially for marine mammals um, that are that are you know carnivores or, or you know predators, they can get quite a concentration of different fat soluble vitamins like vitamin A. So they they can't eat the organs of the seals and the polar bear and, and whales and things like that that they eat because there's actually toxic amounts of vitamin A. And so they feed that stuff to the dogs because they're they're better better able uh, to deal with it and they're better equipped for it. And so they seem to do just fine on skeletal meat and fat. Um, and but they're not really coming from a deficient state. I think some people you know, do need that, and and you know because again, the meat that we're eating isn't as nutritious as like a grass fed, grass finished wild animal. That maybe you do need to to supplement with with some some organs and eat nose to tail. I find that most people do fine with just skeletal meat and fat. And so if they don't enjoy organs. Uh, and they're not in a deficient state that they can they can do just fine with that. I've had liver, I think I think I've had like sort of beef or lamb liver maybe three times in the last decade. But every now and then I'll have some cod liver or like some cod liver oil, something like that, like a tin of that. And uh, but like every few months, if I just think about it, I mean like, oh, that sounds good. You know, I'll sort of have that, and if it tastes good, I'll I'll eat it. Um, but I think that it's important to to um, you know, not go overboard because just like the Inuits who can get who can get quite sick with a small amount of of the liver and organs of the animals that they're eating because they're they have such a high concentration of these uh, nutrients that even with beef liver lamb liver uh, and, and the organs of the animals that we eat that it can become too much and you can get a bit 
more of, of these fat soluble vitamins that you need. So I just try to think of it in proportion of the animal. So you know if you're if you take down you know a, a cow or a buffalo or something like that, um, you know that, that there's enough meat there to feed you for a year or two if it's a big animal, and it has one liver. It's a big liver. But it's still only one liver, and so you know if you're out in the wild, and and you know again going back to first principles, what were our ancestors doing? What are we normally supposed to do? We're not supposed to be able to get liver from a store, you know, all day every day. You know, we, we're supposed to be out there hunting and taking down an animal, and then we eat that animal. And if we're eating the organs, we're still they still only have one liver, and so you might eat that liver. Everyone might get that. And uh, and might enjoy that and benefit from that, but then they're eating the rest of that animal over days and weeks, and uh, and so just try to think about it in proportion. You're going to get a lot more skeletal muscle, meat, and fat than you will to the organs, and so definitely organs are great, but just just think about it in that context and don't don't overdo it because some people do sort of eat like like 500 grams of liver a day, and and those are some of the people that I see having having problems and you know vi- hypervitaminosis a can actually suppress uh thyroid stimulating hormone as well and so people are some people are saying oh well my, my thyroid's tanking on a carnivore diet it must be because of ketosis and all that sort of stuff and um and those are generally the people that are eating just a ton of organs like liver i like um that visual i do like a visual anyway but you you did mention that at the talk and that really stayed with me because i think it makes a lot of sense when you break it down When people are looking about how to approach this and how could it work and what does this mean, I I think a a visual like that is is really useful. And so I'm curious about who the lifestyle um, is for. Um, When I first heard about Carnival a few years ago, I I did get the impression, you're an athlete, I did get the impression it was attracting um, well serious athletes initially. And then other people have come to Carnival for chronic disease, autoimmune conditions, uh, and that's how actually it's become quite famous uh, for America as well, um, being being quite helpful for, for people who've um, suffered all sorts of autoimmune conditions. Um, and then a part of this um, curiosity that I have is how this fits in with families. And, you know, you were asked this question at um, the recent Low Carb Road show, which would you... Um, suggest it for families what what do you think of um of, of families going for this type of lifestyle yeah no I, th- I think it's 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 beneficial for everyone i think that you know homo sapiens sapiens we're all one species and we've been genetically conserved uh, largely for the, about the last three hundred thousand years and like any species of animal you're going to have sim- you know the the biomechanics that that require you to do similar things so you know i've never seen a single example of anywhere in the wild of two members of the same species that have different optimal diets you know lions eat what lions eat cows eat what cows eat and so on and so humans should eat what humans should eat as well and as you can see in all mammals once once weaned from mother's milk that kid will eat what the adults eat and they'll eat that for the rest of their life and so, yes, I think that if, you know, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. So if you're, if you're, uh, you know, if we're arguing that humans are carnivores and that adults should be eating meat, then it's even more important for kids to be eating meat because that's their biologically appropriate, optimal diet. And it's most important while kids are developing. It's most, most important while kids are in utero. And so the mother's diet while, uh, you know, preconception and during Pregnancy and breastfeeding is the utmost importance in a child's development, and uh, and then a close second to that is the first thing that that child eats, and and being fatty meat and with enough meat and fat to grow their brain and grow their body. You know, our our on average, our the average American adult male is five foot eight, but during the times when we were hunting mammoths and and big game, it was on average six foot two to six foot four. And the average health of a population is denotes the average uh, average height of a population denotes the average health of the population. And so, like the Maasai, these guys are again on average six foot three, six foot four, and they're just eating meat. They're just drinking blood and milk, and they're not eating all these other things that that can harm them. Or they go and they start westernizing. They start eating other things, and they are 
fat and uh, and uh, shorter, and they don't develop as well, and they get sick, and they get these chronic diseases that uh, normally the Maasai don't get. And so I think it's it's of utmost importance to to eat that way, especially early on, especially when the child and the fetus is developing. Um, simple fact is that you know our average brain capacity, our average brain size has reduced by eleven percent since the uh, advent of the agricultural revolution. Yeah. Yeah. So on average, our brains are smaller. We think, oh, we're so much smarter. We have, I no, 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 no. We are dumber and we're getting dumber by the generation. And, uh, and our brains are physically smaller. And be, oh, well, maybe we're adapting to that. And maybe it's becoming, you know, becoming it's, 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 it's processing faster. No, I mean, come on, don't be silly. Like it's, it's, uh, it, we're getting worse and we're, we're, not giving our body and our brains what we need to develop, and so our brains aren't developing properly. If you look at uh, the fossil record going back eight million years, you know hominins started going up, 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 up. The brain size started going up. Our our height started going up as well. Then about two million, two and a half million years ago, with Homo habilis, really this is when that people actually started being able to like hunt and not just scavenge and 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 get meat and cut it up with tools and things like that, which we've been doing for about 3.3 million years. Well, the oldest stone tool we found is 3.3 million years old anyway. So God knows how long we've been doing it before, or work stone tool with an edge, I should say, because there's evidence that we've been using rocks as pound stones to crack open the skulls of dead animals and, and get at the brains for probably a few million years before that. And, um, but with Homo habilis, um, you know, the tool using uh, human, that was uh, that was the advent of being able to hunt large game and, and be the primary hunters and actually be able to kill them and get them and get the organs and get the meat, not just scavenge for the scraps. And that's when the, our brain size really started taking off. And it was this, this exponential growth as the fastest uh, increase in brain size of any, any, at any point of any, any animal ever. And, um, and, and then you get to around sort of, you know, 15,000 years ago or so, and it just goes shik, straight down, literally straight down. It's going up, 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 bang, straight down. And, uh, and that's, and that's right in keeping with the, the extinction of the megafauna and like the mammoths and the, the, the giant sloths and cave bears and all these big, massive animals that we were eating. And, uh, and, and as a result of that, people had to start developing agriculture because they're like, Hey, we're just not, we're not getting enough food. We're not getting enough fat. We need to get, we need to do something else. And so that's, that's when agriculture started to come into play and, uh, and our brains went down and our brains got worse and our jaw development didn't, you know, went down. We had smaller jaws with crowded teeth and didn't get our wisdom teeth in. Whereas before the agricultural revolution, all had these big brains, different shaped heads, actually, different shaped brains as well. And, you know, big, high cheekbones, wide jaws, big, strong, straight jawline, and all the teeth, no cavities, no crooked teeth, wisdom teeth always in. And then after that, completely different. So archaeologists can actually tell the difference between a skull before and after the agricultural revolution just because it's so, its teeth are, just, the skull shape is so different. And the teeth are so different as well. And, our, and with yes, malformed mouths, and we have all those uh, dental issues. But that um, that's actually affecting breathing issues and uh, sleep sleep apnea, which then can cause other problems. Um, but yet, but then that can affect also brain development as well, and kind of um, fog if you're if you're not sleeping, you're not breathing, and you don't notice you're you're not. And that's happening every every, every day, particularly at night time. Um, and that all comes down to fundamentally changes in food um, over over generations. And the next generation are uh, up against it even more so because of all the processed foods. I, I talk a lot about the processed foods and, and the sugar in foods and the additives and uh, how high carb foods are and the damage that's doing, but also the soft foods. Now, children are give, being given pouch foods. They're not chewing. Uh, toddlers are, are not not being given real foods as much, and um, and that's that's causing problems as well as missing out on those essential fats. I love um, all of that information about the brain and how how it's changed. I mean, I, I said in my talk at the road show, recent road show, that uh, I like to remind people of the visual of the child's head 
is so much bigger in proportion to an adult's body. And I, I don't know why I love that one so much, but I, I think it really reminds people that there's just so much phenomenal cell growth going on in a child. And just to remind us that that's just such a formative time to get nutrition right. Um, I remember when I was in America a few years ago um, and, and we were kindly given a lift and offered to shout out a family lunch. Uh, and they said, oh, our daughter's on solid. She's only been in solids a few weeks. Um, she can't eat her hamburg from McDonald's yet. It's her favourite food. So we mash it down into a mush with water and feed her that. And I was just thinking then, that was quite a few years back, that what are we doing to the next generation? We're not giving them those foods. And I know we've, we've covered a lot. But back to brass tax, as you've said, um, when we say uh, cholesterol, we talk about saturated fat, we talk about fat for the brain and all of this cell growth and all of the jaw and the change uh, in our in our head structure and our own brain structure. Um, we, we're talking again about old fashioned real foods. We're talking about meat and fats and eggs. The, these are phenomenally important foods for child development. Um, and, and demonized at, at the moment, but they provide protection against in, in infection. It's not just building muscle. I think a lot of people, we talk about protein and amino acids, but actually it's building up um, our defenses against the illnesses, it, it, you know, the absolute basics. Um, and and um, not just the brain being um, predominantly made of fat and containing cholesterol, needing, needing all of that, but it's actually fats when in all aspects of our body, every system, um, every nerve. So, so phenomenally important, so crazily demonized. So I'm, I'm so pleased. You know, a lot of what you're talking, I know it's kind of, um, carnivore is becoming a really hot term. Um, but a, a lot of it I see has been quite old fashioned, traditional back to basics foods, which I'm, I'm quite, uh, into I'm very very into the the traditional types of ways of eating and I I, I do see um, children needing more in their diet so, so what's your hope for carnivore um, well I hope that it, it, it becomes just more mainstream so people understand that this is really the best way to eat and and take care of themselves I think that people are very health conscious actually I think that's the, that's a misconception that people have had over the last 40 years that oh just people are just fat and lazy and they just don't want to work hard they don't want to exercise they just want to eat crap no the problem is that they actually have listened to these terrible recommendations and taken them to heart and it's made them very very sick and uh, and overweight and it's uh, and it's not fair to them and a lot of people you talked so I've talked to gosh thousands of people now uh, thousands and thousands of people now over the years and um, you know a lot of these people are saying this is like you know I, I kept trying I kept trying I kept trying to eat right and do this and do that and my weight was just horrible and you know my hormones were all over the place and and uh, and they were just having a terrible time with it and their health was getting worse and worse and worse doing exactly what they were told to do and then some some of these people that you know the calories in calories out people that I think are just completely misguided and just didn't pay attention to biochemistry class when they you know when the way they told you uh, and or organic chemistry when you found out that all of these different chemicals and molecules have very different uh, biological actions and chemical interactions in your body. They don't just boil down to the energy produced when you burn them in a, in a, in a cylinder. You know, I mean, that's, that's insane. You're, we're not a combustion engine. We're not just burning fuel. You know, we're putting things, we're putting chemicals in our body and they have complex chemical interactions. So of course that doesn't boil down to just calories in and calories out. That's nonsense. Our bodies don't run on calories as far as, as burning energy. That's not how it works. It works on chemical energy and chemical interactions and those things. And every single, amino acid is different and has different biological actions than every other amino acid as same with every single carbohydrate same with every single fatty acid so it is it really matters what you eat and what you put in your body and so you know people have been doing exactly what they were told to do and it's causing the problem and they're having worse of a worse uh, time with it and so just educating them and saying hey actually if you do this this is the right way you will see results and they see it and they go my god you know, this this has had an enormous effect on me. I get dozens of messages every day on Instagram and emails of people saying, like, you literally saved my life. You know, I was circling the drain. I was depressed. I was suicidal. I was, you know, 200 pounds overweight. I had all these medications and all these diseases, all these issues. And now I'm off all my medications. I've lost all this weight. My depression and PTSD is, is basically in the background and not causing a problem. I'm able to play with my kids. I'm able to be there for my grandkids. I have, I'm more active. There are people coming out of nursing homes 
going on carnivore diet. I had a gentleman who is 86 years old here in Perth who uh, a friend of mine who works in geriatrics told me about, um, had basically followed me. Uh, I don't know how he came across me, but he was 86 years old, had to check himself into a nursing home because he was unable to care for himself anymore. And it's basically, he just checked himself into this nursing home for end of life care to die. Basically, he's just going to sit there and wait out the rest of his time. And he went to a carnivore approach as a last ditch effort to save his life and to, to salvage his life. Within months, he was back living at home independently, working out three times a week, swimming twice a week, and off all medications. Within months, you know, he's 86. And so, and then, you know, you look at that and you have these objective measures, all his, his markers are getting better, his doctors are all happy with him, my friend was his doctor, he was happy with all of his bloods and all of everything, off all his medications, everything's doing great. And then someone might say, oh, but you got to stop because it's going to give you heart disease, it's going to give you a heart attack. And it's like, you know what, I'd welcome a heart attack in that case because, you know, at least now he has a life that's worth losing. You know, whereas before he was just, he was just waiting to die basically. And he was already dying. He wasn't able to care for himself. And now he has vitality in life. And of course, that that doesn't mean he's, he's now killing himself. He was really healthy when he was in a nursing home and couldn't care for himself. But now that he's vital and, and working out and, and feeling great, that that's 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 a sign of, of serious illness. And like, what sort of fantasy land are we living in here? You know, and um, the so of course, that that his health is actually improving his objective health is improving by objective measures and and so of course that does that that you know that doesn't mean that he's going to now like die of a massive heart attack and things are just getting worse no he's getting better he's getting a lot better and so i just really want that for people and i really want clinicians and doctors and and nutritionists like yourself to, to come to this and understand that hey look this this really is uh what's optimal for people because i think we're all we all have the same motivations i mean there's some bastards out there that have their own sort of motivations but uh most people um, you know, be they individuals that are just trying to look after themselves, they want to do what's right for them. They want to be healthy. And then, you know, people like yourself, uh, you know, in nutrition space and, and uh, you know, doctors and, and other uh, healthcare professionals, they really actually do care about their patients. They really do want the best for them. And they're just trying to give them the best that they know how. And we've just been taught one thing and, you know, it's not correct. And there's other things that are correct. And we do those things as well. But this got mixed up with, with, uh, you know, the, the good came, with, uh, you know, the bad came with the good. And so just, you know, educating doctors and clinicians and, and just getting people to think and say, hmm, maybe this isn't exactly the way we've always thought it was. And maybe look into things a little bit more and and just think about things. That's that's really what I uh, what I hope people do. And um, and just realize they don't have to be sick. They don't have to be unwell. You know, uh, I mean, our brains don't have to be 11 percent smaller than they were. I mean, even just, you know, kids when they're breastfeeding. Even though there's lactose in the in the breast milk, they're in ketosis, and that those ketones cross the blood brain barrier, re, reconstitute into fatty acids, and it physically grows your brain, right? And then you go off breast milk, and then you start giving them carbs and sugary crap, and they slam them out of ketosis. Now their brains uh, don't grow as fast. So you know that's a big deal. You're not giving them eggs or liver and meat that have choline, and choline is vital for brain development. And you're not getting enough of that from from our our normal standard, even plant based diet. It just doesn't exist in the bun, in the amounts that you need. Carnitine is integral for neuronal development, and people say, "Well, that's a non essential amino acid. We make it." Well, no, actually, only seventy percent of people make enough carnitine, right? And they actually benefit from more carnitine as well in a number of different ways. But thirty percent of people don't make enough, and so they have to make up for it in their diet. And so when you're eating more plant-based and more plant-based and you know it doesn't exist in plants, carnitine, carnivore, carne, it's Latin for body. And so this is of the body. It comes from from animal tissue. It does not come from plants. And so if you're only eating plants, you're eating a majority of plants and you're not making any carnitine, you will not develop your brain properly. And this has actually been shown for, at Texas A&M as, as one of the causes for autism. You don't get enough uh, carnitine and you will and your kid will develop autism or your kid doesn't get enough carnitine it will develop autism and so this is vitally important 
Yeah, and there's other bioactive compounds as well, creatine and um, uh, taurine that, uh, and then, yes, the selenium that come, uh, the first foods we give those children are really important. And um, I know I, I did listen to a few of your podcasts. I mean, I, I listened to them a lot, but I, I heard one of them where you were talking about um, Nestle um, products giving, um, Get, yeah, like full on. And that, that really spoke to me. And that was formula milk. Was it in the sixties? Yeah. I think it was like sixties, seventies. I think they're, they're, they're still pushing it, but yeah, they went, they went, they did a big campaign throughout, you know, uh, you know, rural Africa and, and India and things like that. Very poor areas that they just did. They didn't have the money to spend on, on needless processed foods anyway, but they may, puts this campaign out there that this is, this is scientifically formulated by the best doctors to make the, the, the perfect nutrition for your kids. Right. Um, I mean, I thought that's what breast milk was, right. There's no replacement. I mean, and in the, the few cases where you, you know, you can't continue with that. And there are um, reasons for the mostly, mostly education and support rather than biological to be, um, because we, you know, when I breastfed my children, I thought about it and thought, I've never seen it, never seen it on television, any show, uh, in any of my friendship circles, with any of my family. So yeah, we, we're up against it when we start to feed our children because it's not culturally acceptable. Mm -hmm. That was a really fascinating story. They, yeah. Did you know they actually dressed the, the sales reps up as um, nurses and put no. them in medical uniforms? Oh, bastards. That's yeah, that's a report that I read. Wow. When I was I was working, as I said, in the UK on different nutrition programs for schools. Um, so as a regional person, kind of going into all the schools and the catering offices, trying to improve quality. Mm -hmm. And then in a new program that I just joined, they said, we've got an exciting announcement to make. We've just partnered with Nestle <laughs> to bring food oh, into good. school breakfast club. Oh, oh, good. Um, oh, so we're going to replace eggs and bacon with Nestle candy. products. Yeah, why not? Mm. You know, just yeah, some so Nestle I, Crunch Bars. Yeah, it's perfect. And I had to quit on the yeah. day. I was like, Absolutely. Oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, and good was, for you. Yeah. It was those, you know, you, you just cannot. You know, and that's, I suppose, lots of professionals are doing their best. They're misinformed. The public misinformed. And I, you know, on that baby food and formula food, there's a big report came out in uh, Australia called The Big Squeeze, looking at pouch foods, pouch kind of squeezable foods, which showed that they were full of sugar and additives and actually a, a risk, a harm to your child if you eat them, even though they're claiming to be organic and healthy, not have added sugars. And the same with formula foods, they, they found that there was a big campaign a purposeful targeted campaign to derail breastfeeding education and support so there's lots going on there's lots going on so i'm really pleased you're out there um sharing pretty much an old-fashioned message that meat is good for you uh, i support that message i think um you know that's it's kind of crazy talk well children are being told to eat less and institutions and organizations are considering whether to ban meat so yeah well done and that absolutely infuriates me that that these people are, are, are targeting kids, especially, and trying to get them hooked on, you know, the the you know that the drug that is sugar, uh, early on, and and um, you know for their own, uh, you know, their own ill-gotten gain, and um, yeah, the, you know the Nestle. I mean, they've been doing this for decades. They they went around saying, oh, this is the best thing that you can eat, uh, give to your child, and so you know if you're a moral person and you care about your kid, you're going to buy this product, right? And so people spent what little money they had on formula and uh, not everyone could afford it and they ran out of money and uh, but that point the the mother's breast milk had dried up and they couldn't actually um, breastfeed at that point and so they uh, ended up watering it down and they just said, okay we'll give them more bottles and but the it's water wasn't purified as well so yeah there's a problem with the water contamination water mm -hmm. contamination and also you just it's it's this it's still not enough nutrients even if it's more bottles it's just water it's not nutrition it's not calories it's not it's not vitamins and minerals and the kids were dying you know and uh, and they weren't able to then say like now watching their kids starve to death and not be able to afford the formula for them and not be able to feed them uh themselves which they because they had, had lost their milk at that point i think that that was absolutely I mean, it was obviously a crime against humanity, but I mean, just the, the devastation that that must have caused on such a large scale, uh, it was just pure evil. And um, my parents, since like the 70s, have, have 
never bought Nestle products. They've just they they refused to buy anything from Nestle. You know, uh, even before they did Carnivore, they were just like they would. And that's I remember hearing that as a kid. My parents were like, I would never ever buy anything from Nestle. It doesn't matter what. Um, I mean, it's shocking. Money is what's making us ill, really. You know, um, is it a fifth of the global population are dying because of um, of unhealthy food? Uh, and um, a third of the world's population are um, dying because of four industries, the fossil fuel industry, tobacco, alcohol and unhealthy food. I mean, we're just living in crazy times. Uh, and I think your message of eating more meat will be, um, I don't know, I think it will be very, very controversial. But it blows my mind that other campaigns about um, in food, children being targeted with advertising and um, people dying on epic scales because of industry and profit is isn't controversial but your message is so carry on with your controversial message please oh thank you very much yeah i, I definitely intend to and i you know I've, I've seen the evidence just clearly uh in the in the peer-reviewed literature and in the historical record and in front of my eyes and so you know i'm not that's not something i can i can deny in uh, in good conscience and so i'm just gonna have to to push forward with this come hell or high water. I'll um, pop your um, links to your, we can find you on your podcast that you've mentioned and also your Instagram. They're the two best places, aren't they? Yeah. So yeah, my YouTube is just Anthony Chafee MD and so is my Instagram is Anthony Chafee MD and people can find most everything from there. And just my podcast is just called The Plant Free MD and, that, um, and that's available on any podcast platform. Okay, excellent. Well, lovely. Thank you so much for talking to me. And uh, yes, I'll, uh, I'll let you crack on with your day, but I really enjoyed our chat. Thanks, Anthony. Not a problem at all. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please make sure to subscribe. This really helps us to be able to create more content.